Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Amanda. And we are serving up all that jam. All that jam, quick hit. Rob Linda short history of the Sonics. Today we're joined by Rob Lynn from the Sonics. Uh, I know a lot of people probably have not heard of the Sonics, but they've heard of a lot of bands that love the Sonics and are an influence. Myself, I was nine years old, given like 145s by my stepdad. And uh, one of them was Psycho back with Have Love Will Travel. And that is where I became aware. How are you doing today, Rob? Well, I'm doing great. Thanks. Fantastic. So you got your start pre-British invasion, I guess, like early 60s, maybe even 1960s. What inspired the raw sound in the of the Sonics in those early days? Because there was nothing like that at that time. Well, where I grew up was in the Pacific Northwest. I, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington. Later, when I went to school, I moved to Seattle. But in that part of the country, it was a rock and roll band hotbed. There were rock and roll bands everywhere. And uh, there's, I, I've made the distinction before that uh, there's two cities there, Tacoma and Seattle. Tacoma is smaller. It's a waterfront town. The guys in the Sonics and, and me also our dads were blue collar workers. My dad worked on the waterfront. He ran a crane delivering lumber to ships to go to Japan. And so it was a little bit, I've made the talking to some of the, some of the Brits that I've run into over the years. It's a little bit like Liverpool and London, the music scene. There were all kinds of bands in Seattle and really good ones. There were sax players that were, 20 times better than I am and and uh, they were really uh, almost jazz oriented played real tricky stuff and down in Tacoma the guys that I was with that, that eventually became the Sonics we just wanted to rock and roll we wanted to play hard and as we got popular and started being hired to now they call them shows, but in those days they were dances. <laughs> you know, now, now we play one set, and in those days we played three and sometimes four. And we learned that that's what the crowd wanted. They wanted to dance. So we did everything we could. We did everything that we could figure out of Little Richards, Jerry Lee Lewis, any of that kind of stuff. Anything that came um, came out on popular music that rocked, we wanted to do that. And so we were at that time, we were one of the few groups that were doing that. We were down in Tacoma rocking our socks off. And, and number one, also it's because we liked it. We liked that stuff. So when the Beatles and the stones right at the beginning of Beatlemania, um, when the Beatles came out, we thought they were wonderful um, but we didn't try to do three chord har or three part harmonies. We we weren't trying to do Michelle and the beautiful stuff they did. But when they did Drive My Car, we did that. We jumped on that. When they did uh, Dizzy Miss Lizzie, the uh, the Richard song, we immediately jumped on that. So that's kind of how we got started, and that's kind of where the word got out. As we played, we got. Fortunately, we became more and more popular. And so a local record company said, you guys have, you guys have got to do an album. We got to get you in the studio to do an album. And so we were 17. We thought, God, that's great. Always wanted to do an album. How do you do that? And uh, we played this, we played this club called the red carpet where we really got started. We, we played it one night and, uh, our manager at the time and the owner of the record company came by and said, okay, we're going to get you in the studio. We're going to do an album. 
We said, great, when are we going to go in there? And they, we said, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in downtown Seattle. So we walked into the studio. We hadn't rehearsed. I mean, we, we were play ready because we played four sets a night. So we could, you know, we were tight as you could possibly be. But we didn't have any other originals. We didn't, you know. So we walked in the studio and hooked everything up, you know, and you guys have been in studios, you know, did sound check and all that kind of stuff. And serious looking guys staring at us through this big glass window. We were totally intimidated. And so they, <laughs> so what are you going to do? We started looking at each other and thought, geez, I don't know. What do you want to do? And so we thought, well, the first thing that we would do is the Little Richard song, Keep a Knockin', because that was pretty harsh. So we did that, and uh, it was okay. It, it wasn't really good. It was okay. And uh, Jerry said, well, I've got this song that I've been working on um, called The Witch. And it was, so we kind of figured it out there in the studio. You know, now if if you try to figure out songs in a studio, people look at you like you're nuts. And, and and we sort of were. We were just kids. We didn't know how it worked. So we worked out this song in the studio, and we recorded it. And they immediately ran out. They were going to put it out as a single. They're going to do the uh, witch on one side and uh, keep knocking on the other side. And the local rock radio station, which in those days, it was KJR. And uh, their big rock jocks got a hold of it and we found out later that uh, they would only play it in the afternoons when the kids got home from school they wouldn't play it for the adults during the day so when the kids got out got it got in their cars in the high school parking lot turned their radios on then they could play that well the, the which one insane it, it it sold like 25,000 copies in two or three days I mean just and again, you have to realize we were just kids. We ne- we were playing in rock and roll clubs, and all of a sudden, um, we're opening shows for the Beach Boys, and we're backstage talking to Mike Love, and, and it was a real heady atmosphere. Kinks came to town, and we toured the Northwest, opening shows for the Kinks, and that's how we got to be longtime friends with Ray Davies. It's just because we opened a bunch of shows for him. In later years, he invited us back to London to open some shows that uh, he was doing there. So it once that record got out there, it started happening pretty fast. Then, you know, the the, the normal thing. Okay, we got to get you guys back in the studio. We got to follow up that witch record. And so once again, we're playing at the red carpet. One of the songs that we used to play was just a simple three chord song. It, it, it was on the radio. It was, it was the name of the song was Farmer John, and it was almost a unison song, but it was three chords and four four beat. And so, while they're putting the chairs up on the table, and we got to be back in the studio the next morning, and now we're just hearing about it now. We put the instruments back on and said, okay, how are we going? Well, let's, let's do the Farmer John riff. So we did that. And meanwhile, I digress here a little, and I apologize for that. Um, in those days, most of the drummers were like human metronomes. Their whole bag, particularly the Seattle guys, the jazz guys, their whole bag was just keeping time. Well, there was this British group at the time that came out, the Dave Clark Five, and we really liked what they did. We really liked what they did with the drums, um, with the single stroke roll. So we thought, okay, let's, uh, let's do this Farmer John riff, and we'll put some single stroke roll dumb, dumb, drum breaks in it be in the studio in the morning. So we go in the studio. That's all we had. We kind of ran through it. We went in the studio the next day and uh, Jerry said, don't worry about it. I'll have some words when I get to the studio. 
So we do it. We lay down the band track. Jerry's in there singing, you know, and, and Larry, the guitar player, looked over at me and said, what's he singing? I, said, I don't know. He's singing some words. I don't know what they are. That became psycho, and it just did what the witch did. It just exploded. So with the witch and psycho, nobody was doing songs like that, like I suggested, that, you know, they were doing jazzy stuff. All of a sudden, the rock station is playing the witch and psycho, which are just hard rock, three chord, drum break, guitar solo songs. And at that point, um, we were off and running. You know, you guys created punk rock in that moment. Well, that's generous. I've I've heard people say that, and uh, essentially, I guess that's what we were doing because I I got away from music. I I had to I had to go in the military for a while and go overseas, and I and I wasn't playing music, but. Uh, I, I happened to be somewhere where I can't remember who I heard. It was either the clash. I think it was the clash. And I was listening to them and I was thinking, God, those guys have the right idea. I don't know who they are or where they're from, but they're, but they're killing it. That That's awesome. And I had a talk. I had a chance to meet them years later and they said, uh, yeah, well, we liked what you guys were doing, and we tried to come. I said, you kidding me? You guys play football stadiums. We played, we played punk rock clubs. You know? <laughs> How does that be? And uh, one of the things that I've always enjoyed, I was a professional airline pilot for a long time and playing on the side. And when I retired from that business, Sonics fired up again and started going to Europe and doing tours. And we did Japan and we went to Australia three or four times and New Zealand. But when you do that, you meet other musicians, you meet other bands. And at our first show, the first show we did when we got back together, which was in New York, I did a magazine interview uh, with a rock and a slick, rock and roll magazine i don't remember who it was at the time but the interviewer um, that i sat down was a real nice guy and we had a good time it was a good interview and so later on we played we played the show the place was completely sold out it was really fun and uh we came back to the dressing room all wet and we were going to go downstairs and sign some autographs which is something we did in the early days and this writer came and found me and said hey rob there's a there's a young european rock and roll band here and they wondered if they could have their pictures taken with you and i said sure of course we're gonna be down in a second so we go downstairs and they have these tables set up and all kinds of albums and you know you you've seen the the drill and we were signing autographs and these these five good-looking young guys came up and they're all dressed alike, which impressed me. I thought that's pretty cool. And, uh, they said, you know, basically we, we really like you guys. We always have, uh, can we get our picture taken with you? I said, sure. Come back here behind the table. So they posed for pictures and we were, and I got talking to the guitar player and, uh, we had a nice long conversation back there. And I said, oh, I was so stupid. My God, I, I, I still cringe about, about who I was talking to because I didn't know who I was talking to. And I asked the guitar player, what's the name of your little band? I actually said that. I it was so stupid. I'm so embarrassed because he's a lifelong friend. We've been friends forever. And he said, the hives. And I said, the what? And he said, the hives. I went, oh, well, that's a cool name. So he pulled a dollar bill out of his pocket and got a Sharpie and put his email address and his phone number on there. And he said, you and I ought to stay in touch. We ought to, we ought to talk whenever we get a chance. And that became a, a, long, a long friendship. And every time we played Stockholm, they'd come get on stage with us and play with us. And we'd go out and drink beers and have dinner and Wherever we were, 
they'd always join us and always come up. Well, I had never heard of them. I had to write down the name of their little band. So when I got home after that show, I, I Googled it. And good Lord, <laughs> I found out who they were. Not only are they really good, they were superstars in Europe at that time. They were like they are now. They were, they were filling up football stadiums. Football stadiums. But yep. they asked me to play with them in Seattle. And so I got my sax and went down there, and, and I joined them at one of the big rock clubs in Seattle. And uh, sitting backstage talking to them, there's two brothers, uh, Nick and Pele Armquist. And uh, Pele is the crazy front man, and Nick is the guitar player, his brother. And Pele told me, he said, when we were in high school in, in Sweden, he said, I got a big stack of Sonics records, albums, and I took them to the school cafeteria where we were all eating lunch together. And I said, boys, this is what we're going to do. And that's, that's what they did. They patterned themselves after us, and they did a better job than we did because they're doing a world <laughs> tour right now. Right. Well, also, I, I saw recently on YouTube a show that you did that Eddie Vedder came out, guy from uh, Crash Test Dummies, I think, guy from Screaming Trees. So a lot of people want to get on stage with you. Well, we did it. Uh, yeah, I remember that that was at a at, uh, big record store up in Bellevue, and it kind of opens up. And uh, we, I don't know how it came about, but yeah, Screaming Trees, uh, Presidents of the United States of America. Oh, right, right, not Crash Test Dummies, four, President. Yeah, four or five of the, Seattle, the 90s Seattle area grunge bands. And so we had a rehearsal the day before and everybody, you know, that wanted to came up and did a song with us. And it was a lot of fun meeting those guys and, and doing the Eddie thing is, is funny um, because we, one of the songs that uh, we did and that we do now is, is a song leaving here. And, uh, we were playing that we were at a, at a show in Seattle and uh, we were playing it. And I looked down in front of the stage and right in front of the stage, I'd never seen him before, but I knew who he was. Eddie Vedder was down there dancing and singing the words, you know, in unison along with Freddie, our singer at the time. And uh, so that was kind of, it. so we said, well, any any chance that uh, Eddie Vedder wants to come do a song with us? Because he, he likes us. His guitar player is a really nice guy, and he's a, kind of a friend of the band, but, you know, they're much bigger time than the Sonics were. And I said, well, Eddie's really, you know, you got to go through his PR people, and uh, he's really busy. So we said, okay. So we go to the record store, and uh, we're, we're doing that show. That whole show is on YouTube. You can see it from beginning to end. And uh, somebody came up to the stage and said, Rob, Rob, Rob. I said, yeah, what? Said, Eddie's here. Well, go ask him if he wants to do leaving here. He said, okay. Disappears in the crowd. Comes back and says, yeah, he wants to do it. That's how we found out we were going to do leaving here with Eddie Vedder. I played harp in it, and I was totally embarrassed because it was in a key. It was in A. And I don't like to play harp. And I'm not a very good harp player to begin with. Um, but when I do play harp, I generally play it in C, or, or in G, rather. And Eddie sang it in A, and I had, had to have an A harp. So people say, oh, yeah, you played played harp with Eddie Vedder. I said, no, I stood next to him and made harp noises. <laughs> you know, I kind of, kind of, so there it is on the Internet, and I'm playing this bogus harp solo, which I'm, a little, a little embarrassed about Eddie was awesome. Eddie was awesome. He got into it and, and so did we, and we were real tight behind him and that was a good time. And then afterwards he and Mike McCready, his guitar player came down to the dressing room and they just sat there and BS with us for an hour. <laughs> but he got up there on his own. We, we, I guess we somehow or other would let him know that we were going to be there and he could come, come do that. 
never thought that he would, but he did. And, and he was a real, you know, you can, you can see what he did on YouTube. He was a real professional. He's a real showman. So that was a lot of fun. If you are enjoying All That Jam, please like and subscribe to our social media channels at All That Jam Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or visit our website, allthatjampod.com. Make sure to sign up for our email list and tune in every week for new episodes. Also, look for full interviews on our YouTube channel. And remember, stay beautiful, but don't stay underground too long.